So um, we are very honored to uh, have a very special guest. Um, our guest today is Professor Deva Tenen from the United States. She is a leading expert on social linguistics. She has been doing research in this area for many, many years and with lots of very practical implications as well. And after having read her books, I don't know that I did all of them, but plenty, um, I uh, thought that it would be a real privilege for the followers of our management magazine status to, um, uh, to, to get to know a, a Professor Tannen and to uh, learn about her very unique area of research and about what she can tell uh, managers and students of management and uh, management faculty about cross-cultural communication at work. But before I start with the uh, topic, um, could you kindly tell us a little more about yourself, your background? I know of it, but I think that it would be lovely if you can tell us uh, your story um, because uh, the background is always where we get our insights from. So um, Deborah, many thanks indeed. And uh, uh, what's your story? Yes, um, I, I want to explain why I just looked away for a second. I wanted to put my phone on airplane mode so it does not interrupt us. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My parents were born in Europe, a very uh, typical East European Jewish story. My father in Warsaw, Poland, my mother in uh, Russia, now Belarus. Um, and I grew up in a... Um, really East European flavored uh, environment. I went to college and was an English major, so I was mostly interested in language and literature. And I loved to write and I wrote poetry from the time I was a kid. I was a literary type. Um, after college, it was the 60s. I went to Europe on a one-way ticket and I planned never to come back. I ended up in Greece. I taught English in Greece and that was my first exposure to cross-cultural differences in ways of speaking. Um, came back to the United States for a while. I, um, I got a master's in English. I was teaching remedial writing, freshman composition. And this brings me to the age of about 29. I was bored. I really wanted to be a student again. And I went to a linguistic institute. These are summer institutes run by the Linguistic Society of America. Uh, and it's at different universities each time it runs um, with professors from all over the world and students from all over the world. So I went to this linguistic institute and I was very lucky that just that summer, it was focused on what they called language in context, not the more formal kind of linguistics, but sociolinguistics, using language to understand how people use language in their everyday lives. Sorry, use linguistics to understand how people use language in their everyday lives. And that just lit a fire under me. Um, I fell in love with the thought that this was a way of analyzing language closely as I did in English literature, but using it to understand people and how they use language in their everyday lives. So I applied to the University of California, Berkeley. I was extremely lucky. Uh, that the professor I most fell in love with, Robin Lakoff, uh, was at the University of California, Berkeley, because that probably is the only place I could have done the kind of linguistics I ended up doing. My dissertation, for my dissertation, I recorded a, con well, I was recording all my conversations. We were all doing that at the time, but I picked one uh, where it was a conversation between, among myself, Brooklyn, East European Jewish background, my best friend, Bronx, East European Jewish background, his brother, same background, 
friends of his who were from California, not Jewish, and his former wife, uh, who was a very interesting Jewish father, but grew up in, in England. My idea was that I was going to understand everybody's what I call conversational style, all the subtle things about how we say what we mean. And I'll talk more later about what I have in mind when I say conversational style. I was going to analyze each individual's conversational style and how that affected the conversation. It turned out that I couldn't because I could not really um, experience the conversational styles of the non-New Yorkers because they had a hard time getting the floor. Whereas for me and my friend, uh, I call him Steve and his brother, we were <laughs> freely telling stories and interacting. Now, it's very interesting, the Californians and also the British women were able to tell stories. They could get the floor and keep it for a story, but they couldn't be part of the back and forth, the, the the flow. That is what really got me on the path that I ended up specializing in ever since, um, that people from different backgrounds, and it could be different languages, different cultures, but also different parts of the country, different ethnic backgrounds, different class backgrounds, um, have these different conversational styles. And when they talk to people whose style is similar, you don't even think about style, you know, you just have a conversation, uh, you think that you have a pretty good idea about who they are, what they intend. You trust them to have a pretty good idea of who you are, what you intend. And it does pretty much work that way if you have a relatively similar conversational style. But when people have conversations with different conversational styles, there is the constant um, risk on the one hand that they may have a hard time getting the floor because turn-taking styles are different. Again, I'll say more about that. Um, and they may have conclusions about what the other person intends that are not what that person really intends. So it's just the very quick, very quick explanation that's kind of, I use it as a kind of a, a typical example of these conversational style differences. Anytime two people talk, you have to have some way of indicating when your turn is over and it's their turn to begin. We do this in many ways by intonation patterns. We might slow down to show we're getting to the end. And we might have a sense of how long a pause is normal to indicate, and I'm done, you can take the floor. Anytime two people have a different sense of how long that pause should be, Okay, so I'm expecting this much pause, you're expecting that much pause, this much pause comes first. I think you have nothing to say, you don't want the floor, and I jump in. And it's really as much as anything, uh, being a good citizen, being a good participant, you don't want the conversation to run down, you don't want there to be silence, which would be uncomfortable. And so you take the floor, and meanwhile, this one is still waiting. <laughs> And when that happens over and over and over, you end up with mutual misunderstandings and mutual um, erroneous attributions of intent on the part of the other. So this person thinks you only want to hear yourself talk. You're not giving me a chance to talk. And this person is thinking, why are you making me do all the work here? Don't you have anything to say? <laughs> so that is very classic. Um, and, and I will venture to... Uh, to suspect that this does happen often among speakers of Israeli background and people from other parts of the world which might have these longer longer pauses and there are many other aspects of conversational style I could I could mention but that is that's the fundamental um, approach that I ended up developing in all my research so uh, this is really fascinating and um, a I uh, think that it's of big value for uh, people in management because on the one hand, we all preach diversity because we believe that diversity creates more creativity, more innovation, more out of the box uh, thinking. Uh, but uh, it involves this great challenge of cross-cultural communication. 
So based on your uh, very, very unique research, um, what would be your advice for uh, people who lead uh, organizations with diversity? What can they do for their people? Yes, uh, diversity is far more complicated and challenging than one initially thought. I think the, in the beginning and, and many places still, there's a feeling that you must hire a diverse um, staff or, or organization and your work is done. You know, you've diversified. You have diverse people uh, in your team, but the effect is not going to be positive if you're not aware of conversational style differences. So that is my uh, overall fundamental advice to be aware of conversational style, what I call conversation, it's kind of my own term, but uh, what I'm calling conversational style, ways of speaking. Um, and this uh, question of how you get the floor, there's an immediate awareness you need. Um, you might find people you hire are, um, seem to be um, dominating the conversation because they're talking too much, or you might feel they're not doing their part, they're not talking at all, or not talking enough, and it could be a difference in this sense of pause. Uh, another thing that is very often different is um, an attitude toward opposition, argument, um, and this, and uh, you probably know um, a lot of the work that I've done and a book that I wrote, You Just Don't Understand. It is, it is translated into Hebrew, um, and I, I think the title, well, you can probably find out what the title is, um, but it is often a difference between women and men, as well as can be between people of other cultures, uh, that you say an idea, your colleague starts poking holes in your idea. This is terrible, that's bad, what about that? And very often, women, at least in the United States, will back off. I guess it's a terrible idea. And then he may bring up the same idea later and you just think he's stealing your idea and um, blame him for that. <clears throat> there are uh, many people, again, it can be cultural, it can be gender, you know, often it's more often men than women in the United States. You're playing devil's advocate. You're helping someone explore their idea by poking holes as somebody else might. It's kind of like an academic um, con uh, context. And, and that too, by the way, differs in different countries. Americans are often quite horrified in European, French, German, often it's more uh, normal. You give a paper and everybody attacks it. <laughs> and that's just a way of thinking about it and helping you um, answer questions that, that you should be thinking about. Um, so that's something that can have a, a big effect in a diverse workplace. Um, so, yeah, and, and I don't know how, I could go on the rest of the time about all these differences in conversational style, but um, I, I'll tell you another one that's funny because someone um, ex mentioned that this actually happened. Um, so I write in my um, book about women and men that often um, a woman will raise an issue just to talk about it. And the fact that you're talking about it, it might be a problem. The fact that you're talking about it makes you feel connected, you're interested in each other, you explore it back and forth. Um, and they often are frustrated if they tell a problem to a guy and he just tells them how to solve it. And this one woman realized that that was happening at work with a colleague of hers. Uh, she would bring up an idea and he would immediately just, from her point of view, shut down the conversation by telling her, oh, well, this is the solution. And so she brought it up to him and she said, no, I just read this book and it really made me realize that we're having this difference. And she explained it and he said, oh yeah, here's what we're gonna do about it. <laughs> so um, yeah. these, these ways of having conversations are very, very automatic. Um, but it is definitely an issue. Um, I might as well mention one more really common one. Um, and I found this in my own workplace research. I have a book called Talking from Nine to Five based on um, several years of research I did where I went into workplaces, I observed, I had people carry tape recorders and record themselves. Then I um, kind of went to work every day for, got to know everybody and, and talked to people at all levels. Uh, one thing that I found, and this is often commented on, 
women said, I'm sorry, more often than men. And women are frequently told, stop saying I'm sorry. You know, it makes you seem like you're unsure of yourself. You think everything's your fault. And I was able to observe, and I think when you mention it, people realize that's what they meant. Often when women say I'm sorry, it's not, it's not a fault. Uh, it's not, you know, you, when, when you're at a funeral and you say, I'm so sorry, you're not pleading guilty to a murder charge. You're, <laughs> saying, that, you're saying that you uh, understand the other person's feelings. You're sorry, you regret this happened. You want them to know. It's kind of like, um, I'm sorry that happened to you. Uh, <laughs> and it was one of many ways where women are using a way of speaking that is really focused out you know, I'm sorry, I mean, you're taking into account the other person's experience. And it's interpreted as an expression of something going inside, something going on inside their own head. She feels uh, lacking confidence. She thinks everything's her fault. Um, and it, it can, this and many other similar uh, styles, and I can mention more, um, is one of the things that is a problem for many women in the workplace. Um, if they talk in ways that are associated and expected of women like that, like saying, I'm sorry a lot, uh, they, they are in, they're underestimated. Their true competence and, and uh, confidence is, is not appreciated. They're seen as lacking in confidence and incompetence in some cases. Um, so what if they decide, okay, I'm going to talk like the guys. Well, then they're seen as too aggressive. So you have to find that that middle road, um, and it's a challenge. And again, that's an example that's very common among women and men uh, in this country and, and in many others too. But it's more, from my point of view, it's more the uh, phenomenon and the way it works that we need to think about rather than women do this, men do this, Israelis do this, Americans do this. You know, Israelis have many backgrounds, Americans have many backgrounds, women and men have many backgrounds. So it's the phenomenon, it's how it works that you need to be aware of. Not, not, it's not about labeling people. Fascinating, it really is. And um, uh, let's uh, drill down a little bit on what I got as your major advice, which is to be aware of the phenomenon. And um, if as a management consultant, which is my job, I want to help managers create this awareness in themselves and in their people, then uh, would you say that one option is to your, use your very interesting research method, which uh, let's say in one of the meetings, just to stop and to ask permission to record a little part of the conversation and then to replay it and to listen to it and uh, to ask the people uh, what insights they get uh, from uh, this conversation. And would that be accepted in uh, the United States, uh, in New York, in California, <laughs> in Tel Aviv, in London? Or would that be considered uh, too pushy? Because um, I thought that it could be lovely, but maybe I'm mistaken. <laughs> Okay, well, this expression, too pushy, <laughs> is very often applied to New Yorkers, as you know, to Jews, to people of um, a whole range of backgrounds, African Americans, for example, um, people, Eastern Europeans in general, it's really not Jewish, it's Eastern European, Russians, Poles, um, <laughs> and um, I always bristle when I, when I hear that word, because what does it mean? It just means your style is different and it's making an impression on people who don't understand, appreciate, uh, and are not able to function in that style. So they blame you. <laughs> uh, what, I think that's a wonderful idea. Whether or not it will uh, work depends on a bunch of things. Um, people often feel criticized when their way of speaking is called to attention. Even if it's to a positive thing, they, they become uncomfortable. 
um, it's like you're being gazed upon too closely. And uh, so if people real, if they approach it, if they think they're going to be taped in order to be criticized, they're going to resist. Um, and of course, cultures differ with regard to how comfortable we are about being recorded, because now we're living in this uh, <laughs> security conscious culture where you're recorded all the time and it can be used, feel, there's a strong feeling it can be used against you. Um, but I think if people are in an environment where they trust each other, where they feel that each other's um, stance toward them is, is cooperative and positive, I think that can work. <clears throat> but they have to be interested. They really have to be interested because there are many people who feel, oh, that's not important. Let's get down to work. And they don't realize that how you are speaking is making it possible to work well or get, getting in the way um, of working um I, I i i hope that i will be courageous enough to try it and i promise to share with you if i do uh because i think that it is a, a fascinating and i think that it is very important now if um, I, I want i, I will to i will interrupt i'll interrupt one thing um sometimes people become self-reflective on their own um if they're introduced to these ideas in the abstract, not this is what you're doing, but look at this, this is the kind of thing that can happen. And, and then they on their own will say, hey, I think that happens to me. So that's, that's another way. And of course, reading my book is one way or articles, I have an article in the Harvard Business Review that's based on that book about the workplace um, and, and even a training video that I made, but you could just have somebody come and talk about it or, um, agree to read an article so that people are not, they don't feel somebody else is analyzing them, but they're coming to this um, conclusion on their own. I like this idea very much. So first of all, uh, uh, we will uh, share some of your uh, articles and the written advice and videos with the followers of our magazine. And, um, and we might uh, implement it in the workplace when we consult uh, with, uh, with clients. Um, again, I would like, if I may, to drill down a, a little deeper and to say that uh, um, organizations spend a lot of uh, time and money preparing their people to relocate. And we know that uh, relocation is a big challenge and very often it fails. And very often it fails because of lack of cross-cultural communication skills. And um, uh, would you say that uh, the old advice in Rome behave like Romans, <laughs> which... Uh, I have to admit, this is usually my advice to uh, to people. Um, um, you you want to to be able to become a part of the game. So in Rome, you should behave like Romans. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe it's not a good advice because you can never behave like Romans, even if you try. So as, as a real expert on all of this, what would be your advice on this? Uh, that's such a good point. You're uh, going to run into this same, what I call double bind, which I described for women. You know, you act as you're expected to act as a woman. You're underestimated. You act as you expected to act like a boss. You're too aggressive. That can happen if you're in Rome <laughs> and you're not a Roman. Um, if you try to behave exactly the way the Romans do, you may be seen as inappropriate, as trying to be something you're not. Um, but if you don't, <laughs> you then you may be misunderstood. So I think it's you. The, the first step again is to know what are these differences in ways of speaking that might be an issue. So first you observe and try to see what's going on. Um, I'll give you another example of this um, double bind. Again, when I was doing the work on the workplace, I interviewed pilots 
because women were pilots for the first time. And one pilot told me, he said, you know, when we were all guys in the car cockpit, we curse all the time. You couldn't really be there if you weren't cursing. But when we get women there, we cut it out. And we have had women pilots who try to be one of the boys by cursing. And that is not acceptable. It makes people dislike her and it does not work. So it's a perfect example. The Romans, the pilots, have a way of doing it when it's just guys. You have to acknowledge that they're going to expect different ways um, of speaking from you. Um, I think in terms of m moving places, I remember talking to someone who was from the south, somewhere in the south of the United States, uh, where she was seen as quite outgoing. Then she moved to some northern city where she had a hard time getting the floor, so she was not as participatory. And she was told that she needed to get training um, to not be so self-effacing. To <laughs> She was the same person. It was just these differences in conversational style. You can push yourself to be, if you're the one who never gets the floor, you can push yourself to begin speaking a little bit before it feels completely comfortable. Or if you're the one doing all the talking, you can push yourself not to talk as soon as you think you should, maybe count to seven or eight before you talk, and you might be amazed. The other person does have something to say. So you can make these adjustments if you know what phenomenon you're trying to change and what's having the effect that you don't like. And you can meta-communicate. You can talk about it. So if somebody says to her, you're not, you know, you're lacking in confidence, you have nothing to say, you can point out, well, I have lots to say, but I've been having tr trouble getting the floor because it's so, it's ha happening so much faster than what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, I would love to um, get your advice on what I think is a cross-cultural uh, issue a cross-cultural communication issue um, in the workplace, uh, which again has to do with diversity as an advantage, but with the challenges coming with it. Um, uh, we have generations gap at work. We have um, uh, young people and older people, and now generations are getting very short because it seems that because of technology, the culture is so different. Even uh, uh, between brothers or among brothers, if there is some, some age gap between them. So um, if you have any insight regarding that. Um, uh, could you share some of it with us, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, some of the frustration that I have encountered, people have told me about, is not so much about language, um, but about approaches to work. Um, older employees feel younger employees are too quick to leave because the end of the day, the time came and they expect someone to just stay till it's done. Uh, and, and there's a frustration, maybe criticism about modes of dress. They see the young people coming to work dressing more informally than they think is appropriate. So, so there is all that. Um, in terms of, of communication, it's often, as you say, um, uses of these different social media or different platforms. Um, among many young people, there's a real aversion to using the telephone it's become a sense that it's very intrusive. You do not call somebody on the phone. And I have actually had some of my students say they've become telephone phobic. <laughs> They're almost scared to make a phone call. They don't really know how to do it. One student told me, if you're trying to order some food and the online isn't working, you won't pick up the phone. You're gonna go to another website because <laughs> you don't wanna have to talk to somebody. There are some kinds of uh, work that really needs to be done on the phone. Uh, and there can be a feeling among the older employees, again, that um, these younger ones are just wasting time doing all this when they could just pick up the phone and, and get it done. And there is, of course, the issue 
and I think everybody's aware of this, um, if you're dealing with people on the phone or talking, um, in the, especially face-to-face, -face, you kind of develop a relationship in a way that you don't when you're just sending an email. It may seem that you're getting the work done quickly, but in the end, you're losing a kind of a bill, um, the way I sometimes put it, when small talk in the in the workplace was by by some people looked down on you wasting time, but actually engaging in small talk creates the relationships that then makes it easy to get the work done efficiently. So that's that's um, another loss. I'll give you one more specific example with a difference among you know small just a few years. So I was interviewing a woman who had been out of college in three, four years. She worked in a particular workplace. There was an intern, so current current college student. And she was you know, supervising him. They seemed to be going well. At some point, they were getting real friendly. And they had that conversation you often have. Um, Gee, what did you think of me when you f first met me? And he said, I thought you were a bitch. Now, using that language right there was probably not the best shocking to her. But in addition, she was shocked by the idea. Why, she said. She said, he said, well, your emails. No exclamation points, no, <laughs> no caps, no uh, all these ways that you show you're friendly. You weren't doing that, so that's why I thought that. Now, again, you've got this double bind <laughs> that she wasn't texting as he expected a woman to text. Maybe, you know, girls will do that to, to show how friendly they are. Um, and so he was seeing her, that word, that B word that is always out there ready to be stuck on, on a woman. Um, but it, it really was this different expectation about using uh, social media. Um, emails can, can seem friendly or unfriendly, depending on the habits of the person you're communicating with. And you don't think of it. You're just doing it the way it seems normal to you and judging other people by the way that seems normal to you. And that's where it gets tricky. This is so fascinating that I ask myself if in addition to creating awareness as a very important key success factor to improve behavior uh, in this regard. Um, is it okay? Uh, do you think that it would be culturally <laughs> accepted, um, let's say in the United States, and then, uh, I, I don't know, New York or California, you choose. And I... Um, uh, since I know that you know us a little, that you know Israel and Israelis a little, if you think that it's a good idea uh, for us as well. And the question is if um, creating a conversation just as we do now around this, these issues um, would be a good way to deal with the double bind, which I absolutely agree. It's a big issue, especially in the cross-cultural communication uh, between men and women. Absolutely, there is always diversity there. Um, and, and your example of uh, uh, cursing, uh, you know, in the, in the boys club. And uh, I can tell you what was my, uh, a choice, and I don't know if it's, it's a good one, you can give me feedback. When I uh, started doing this work of management consultant, most of my clients were men. So it was very common for them to ask what you uh, mentioned before, that all of a sudden, wow, Edna is in the room. Um, and I uh, wanted them to feel okay. And I said, that's okay. Uh, you can go on with your jokes. Uh, I love dirty jokes, no problem. But I never told dirty jokes. So I encouraged them to keep their own uh, norms of behavior, but I 
I never imitated them. So do you think that my way of treating this double bind was a good one? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, and again, it goes back to what I mentioned. If you talk in a way that's not expected of whatever group they see you as part of, um, you're seen as either a bad example of that, not a good woman, uh, or you're seen as, as trying to be something you're not, pretending it doesn't seem authentic. So yeah, um, with all of these things, I think it's always something to consider what we call meta communication. So M-E-T-A, meta, you talk about communication. And again, you have to be careful because some people will feel you're criticizing them if you start talking about their way of speaking. Uh, the more you can put it on yourself, the better, rather than telling them about their style. Uh, you can talk about your intentions, your experience, uh, and maybe, again, reference to other people, to something you read. But, um, but I think that's, that's a very good middle, middle ground. So you're not trying to be a Roman, but you're at least, <laughs> you're at least um, approving of the way the Romans are and that will make you fit in better or be more comfortable. Yeah. And maybe we can uh, talk about the advantages of a specific norm and uh, uh, at the disadvantages openly if we talk about the cross-cultural communication. In, uh, in the examples that you gave before, which are so important at work, when there are meetings and you really want to create a learning environment and uh, an environment where people uh, are learning from a past behavior and trying to improve, uh, maybe it is a good idea uh, to 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 open up uh, and and uh, to speak about all of this uh, openly. Maybe uh, yes, uh, but again, this this is very fascinating to me. Speaking openly in itself is a conversational style. People who tend to be more direct talking to someone who tends to be indirect. You can't get the other person to be more like what you want. You often end up getting farther and farther apart. So quick example, two people are speaking. One thinks the other is speaking a little too loudly. That person thinks this person is speaking a little too softly. So this person may just get a little bit louder to encourage that person. And this is so abrasive. This one is going to talk even and you're going to end up with one shouting and one whispering. It's an exaggerated way to describe it, but people often react that way. And this is a real conversation that was reported to me. I wrote about many years ago in a book called That's Not What I Meant. Uh, there was a guy who was asking a woman at work if she wanted to go to lunch with him. And she said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. I've got so much work this week. So the next week he asked her again. And she said, no, you know, I'm really not feeling that well. I kind of have a headache. <laughs> And then the third week, he, he tried to be direct. He said, is it that you really had work and you really didn't feel well, or do you just not want to have lunch with me? There was no way on earth she was going to say, look him in the eye and say, no, I don't want to have lunch with you. So she got even more indirect. Well, you know, <laughs> um, if you believe that people should pick up hints, you're not going to be able to talk about it in another way because it will seem wrong. Again, yeah. unless you've meta communicated and made a decision that we're going to we're going to uh, talk that way. Um, I think of an example uh, of a, actually was an Israeli visitor to a university where I was teaching at the time and uh, talking to a colleague who was quite well known in the field and showed interest in that colleagues work, they were both women, by telling her what she critiqued about her work. And the American was so offended that she didn't even want to talk to this woman anymore. And it was so clear to me that it was a cultural difference. You know, showing somebody you've read their work carefully and you've thought about it, that could be a sign of respect and appreciation. But knowing when it's appropriate to be critical, I think most Americans wouldn't do it right off the bat. It would come up way, way later. The first time you have to say, 
I love your work. <laughs> you're brilliant. You're wonderful. And then down the line, you bring up. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Deborah, I could go on talking to you forever, honestly. Uh, maybe because we have some similarity in our uh, academic background uh, and uh, love for communication and understanding communication better. So I, uh, but I don't want to, to go too long. <laughs> Uh, and I uh, would like to uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing all of your experience and knowledge and great examples. And um, uh, I hope that we can pick it up uh, someday in the future to go forward uh, with it. Um, uh, thank you. And I look forward maybe to someday interview you in Israel <laughs> when you come for a visit. Uh, would you like to say something for, for a final remark? Yeah, uh, it's been a complete pleasure speaking with you. Uh, and clearly we are operating on very, very similar planes and thinking in very similar ways. Um, and I am always so impressed by people like you who are actually working with people to put these insights into um, into effect. Uh, I, I often get asked, do I see private patients? Because they think I'm a psychologist and I think I have such respect for psychologists, but no, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, but your, your work is clearly frontline, really putting these ideas into practice. And to me, that is the most um, important and, and uh, useful thing to do with all this, with all this uh, ways of thinking. But it's really been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.